which unit were you in the longest? That unit, actually. Oh. <laughs> the unit I worked the hardest and I liked the most. <laughs> eh, wasn't that unit the longest? Um, it was. A, it was a good time. Do you know how long you were in the other units? So, um, in the 97th OSS, like I said, I was in there for two years and six months, but I was also kind of like working in conjunction with Honor Guard, mm -hmm. um, where I would go, which is FSS, uh, Flight Services, uh, Flight Support Services. Um, so I was kind of working in two squadrons at the same time, at that time frame, but my time frame of service within Honor Guard was only a year. That's the long as they let you do it. Um, and after that, I was at Al Jabber for six months, which was in Kuwait. And then I was in Jordan for six months. And then I was in UAE for like, it wasn't long, but it was nice. <laughs> it was two months, uh, two or three months. Really nice space. Um, uh, and then I was at Nellis for three years yeah three years and then I was at Keesler for three months and then I was at Altus Air I'm not Altus Air Force Base uh Shepard Air Force Base which is where I trained for my weapon stuff I was there for three months as well actually air traffic control school was four months so I was like I was four months and now at Keesler actually oh. um, did you have any life-changing experiences a couple <laughs> um, so one of my first injuries in the military um, was I I learned to like uh, so one of the first times that I experienced like a loss of like life or a friend was in the military um, I've always had a family member uh, I've had a family member that I lost, but I was really young. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't understand it within the adult mindset until I was in the military, uh, where I lost a close friend. Um, and I lost a, two pilots that I had worked for for three or four years and knew them. And we lost two helicopter pilots. Um, so that was kind of like hard for me, but becoming an understanding of just loss and just not someone being there and then the next day they're not and you're just like it's just weird mm -hmm. and especially with somebody you've cut up laugh with experience day to day with like i said in those type of units we were close we spent 17 18 hours a day that we're we're almost married <laughs> uh, we're brothers um so that was really hard for me um and then i guess like i said earlier the the mistake i made um that trust but verify where i almost blew carts because it could have been a a huge ordeal. What if that was a munition instead of a fuel tank? That could have went off and killed people, you know? That's scary. Um, as far as other life-changing experiences, um, I would say it would probably be the day I had a name tag uh, put on. I, so, like, in the military, when the Air Force at least, um, you get to earn your uniform. So, after the first two weeks of basic training, you get your, your ABUs, you get your blues. And then before you could put your name on it, they just put, um, no, no, they just they just put your name on it. And then, well, your name's on this side, and the U.S. Air Force is over on over your heart. And so when at the first day I got my name, I was like so excited, and my my boss was like, "Why are you so excited?" He's like, "He's like, this is your main family." And I was like, "What do you mean?" He's like, "Do you ever want to know why the U.S. Air Force is over your heart?" And I was like, "No." He's like, "It's because this is what's closer to you." We're the ones who are going to be there for you day to day. They're not going to be there day to day. And so that kind of made me like open minded in that sense of thinking like I do have another family. And then also the second thing he said to me, he said, but don't forget about your family name. And I was like, I won't. And he's like, he said, no, but seriously, so many people go through and they forget their name. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, just think of it this way. He's like, any job you do, anything you do, there's going to be people around you, people you work with, people that see you. And they're going to see your last name, and they're going to tie it to your family and how you were raised, what kind of people they are. So you are constantly on patrol. You're constantly a role model, constantly an image, a symbol of your entire family. So your judgment of character as a man is based off of your work, and you have your name advertised right here. 
So anything that you do, it's like if you want to be lazy, then you can just show what kind of family you have or may, and be a bad representation of that. Just know that you're constantly on alert. You're constantly a representation of that. And so that was kind of like something that made me think, wow, I never thought about it in that sense because it was there in a physical, visible format for me. And so that's actually helped me even outside the military where I'm doing civilian jobs or in an academic environment. I'm like, I'm representing my entire family day to day. And all my actions, if I lie, I'm representing them, you know? So it's just, it's, it's one way of thinking about it that I'd never thought about it before, you know? So that was eye-opening for me. Um, and then, of course, how big the world is, you know, not just Aiken, South Carolina. Um, and then not being so naive as to being absorbed so much within my own culture that I'm not understanding the bigger picture of what's happening around me. And so that kind of got reinforced a lot while I was in the military. Um, and by that, I mean, like, what's happening overseas? You know, like last, like yesterday, um, a tanker just got, oil tanker got hit by uh, missiles off the coast. And even though it happened again previously a month ago, I now know why gas today jumped 20 cents, and it's because of what happened yet last night. <laughs> Are you, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's just being able to stay informed and, about what's going around and correlating those things within your day-to-day life. So you've talked about being overseas in Kuwait and Jordan. How was being stationed over there different than being stationed in the U.S.? So when you're over there, um, like I said, you're very close. So like for me at the time when I first went, I was living in a tent because I was at E3. Um, and you're in a tent with 25 to 50 other guys. And it's just this big open tent. And so, of course, what we did to have some privacy um, is we would hang bungee cords, string, yarn, wherever we could find any type of rope alongside the um, columns and pillars at the ends. And then we'd run just basic bedding sheets as walls. So our, essentially my bedding area was from probably the end of that table to about right about here roughly. That's my bed <laughs> and my little walk area. And so that was interesting to be alongside. I mean, I've lived with guys in basic who were right next to each other. But this was two guys to one room, you know, in this area. Whereas in basic, I had my own bed, fortunately. Um, and so you're just around each other constantly. You hear everything that the other person's doing. You're around everything that they're doing. And so, like I said, you're just, you kind of learn to just live in that type of environment and sacrifice on certain things and give way to certain things, whereas normally you wouldn't tolerate it, you know. Now I could fall asleep in the middle of a, a bomb going off I don't know like something like I can fall asleep anywhere now just because I'm so used to that atmosphere and then what's also cool about there is you don't you can't just go out to the bar drinking you can't just go out to go to a movie you can't go do these socialistic or functions events or anything like that so you create your own events in-house so for us we play spades if you were if you were deployed and you didn't know how to play spades just you were taught spades within three or four days and we do like basic like Olympics, like which is just like these challenges amongst our own units and be like, hey, who's the best unit? And then we'd have basketball and other intramural sports and go against each other, all the other units and have that type of camaraderie and rivalry between each other. And so that was kind of cool, which is something that you don't traditionally really have on bases. You do, but you don't see it because bases are so big and you're worth in your work, one work unit, you know, whereas on a deployed location, you can walk anywhere that you need to go to. You're not driving anywhere. And so you're constantly walking, everyone's walking. It's almost like a European town because you get to meet everybody, you know, whether you're at the laundromat, you know, washing your clothes, you may find out that you're washing your clothes right next to the commander. And so you start talking to him at 2 a.m. in the morning, which is what I've done for 30 minutes, which is something I would never be able to do back in Nellis Air Force Base where I'm I'm not going to wash my clothes next to an 06, you know, (laughs) like it's just not, it's just not going to happen. So you get this blending of everybody through those um, aspects as well. And then what was cool is we'd have actually events that were hosted on base or these sites where you'd have, like we had the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders come out one time and do a performance. We had singers come out and do performances and stuff like that. Um, So that was kind of cool. So I got to see a lot of cool performances that way. Um, As far as how else it was different, um, you can't go off base, you're confined. So all, all of your needs and wants and everything are confined to that one base. And then certain countries are called dry countries, so you can't even drink. 
you know? And in certain countries within the Middle East, you can't even eat certain things like pork because it's a religious item. So they, you can't have bacon. <laughs> like what man doesn't want bacon? <laughs> so it, it, that was, that took some time to get used to. Um, as far as how it's, it's different. Uh, no, you're working longer hours. You're definitely working harder, but it's more enjoyable and it's because you see the impact of what you're doing day to day. So whereas like in, in a traditional environment or back in the States, you know, you go to do something, you load up a jet, you go get it ready, you get it prepped, and you don't know what's happening and what the fruition of your efforts that day. Whereas, because it's just training sometimes. Whereas overseas, you see, okay, you read the newspaper article, this happens, like, I was a part of that. That's cool. So you see the impact of it. So it motivates you more, and it also kind of, like, gives you that that sense of, like, worth. You know, like, I'm making a difference. I'm doing something, you know, for people back home. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also experiencing that first holiday away from home, Christmas, you know, and Valentine's Day and Easter and Thanksgiving. That's rough. And so you learn to adapt and adopt a new family of your own, like I've said previously, and you guys are just so close. Um, and a lot of times we have our own like in-house betting and gambling on Super Bowl and stuff like that to that nature. So we, we always had things we would stimulate within our own atmosphere to create enjoyment and entertainment, you know, to entice us. Um, supervision out there is definitely more strict. There is no such thing as like a day off. You know, you don't get days off, it's 24 seven, whereas here a lot of jobs you know you work five six days of the week and then you get sunday off you know or saturday off Um, whereas there you're constantly working it's a constant cycle um and then also every day you're getting briefed while you're out there about what are the threats in the local area what can you expect today Uh, for me like i said when i was um serving in a capacity as a security forces augmentee um, i got briefed one day that there was a after Raqqa was bombed and ISIS was fleeing south towards Syria, we were told that they were getting in Cadillac trucks with um, bombs in them and then bomb rushing the gates of our ins- of installations on the way down, not just ours. And so the entry control point I was at just happened to be the highest threat level. And so it's like, just prepared, you know, if you see this and this could happen. I was like, okay. So I'm sitting there with my wingman at this um, entry control point and there's all these barriers lined up and I'm thinking like, I have this gate behind me and it's locked. So somebody's gonna bomb me at this gate because it's not really built up. There's not like a security, it's not like an active gate where people are constantly coming in and out. You know what I mean? Where like your main entry control point, it's just a side entry control point, it's not used. And so I'm like, if someone were to come, I'm, I'm gonna die. You know, I'm just, I face it. It's not like I can get out of my car, unlock the gate, get back in the MRAP vehicle, the tank, and then, no, it's not a tank, but it's just like an armored vehicle, and then roll back out, like, you know, it's just, that's it. So, um, we had barriers there, and so I, we actually called in and got a, um, I forgot the name of that vehicle, but it's just a giant forklift, and it came and moved the barriers for us, and we actually set up, like, a staggered barrier line so that they were to come, they would have to hit all these barriers before they hit our gate. And so we did that. Not five minutes after I did that, we had a vehicle. It was a Toyota Prado out in the middle of a desert. A Toyota Prado. <laughs> um, drive by, and he slowed down. And I'm like, that's weird. And then he came back, and he did another pass, and he slowed down. This time, he rolled down the window, and the guy in the passenger seat had a camera, and he was videoing. I'm like, okay, this is super weird. So I called it and reported it. We get reinforced the gate where I was at with some security forces guys. And so the next time the Toyota Prado came back, it had a Cadillac truck behind it. So I'm like, this is it. This is where stuff's going to happen. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So I'm, I'm just prepared. I'm like, whatever. There's no amount of preparing you could do at that point. And so, of course, my heart was like dropped. I'm like, what's about to happen is going to happen. And so I we moved our vehicles and um, as fast as we could, got out of the vehicles and got behind them and just braced for what was going to happen. But luckily, because we had um, reinforced that point with uh, six other vehicles and two other MRAPs that were in patrol in that area, they saw that amount of threat there. And the guy went to drive off. He came off the road about, not even that far, but about five feet. And he's like, no, I'm going to come back on. And so 
we had other MRAPs patrolling outside the installation, and so they actually ended up finding that vehicle 10 minutes or 10 miles off base, stopped it, arrested the guys, got them out of it, and the vehicle had explosives in it. Oh, my God. So that's crazy, you know? Um, but just stuff you have to be prepared for in that regard. Because, that, that, like, typically in that installation where I was at, Al Jabber, Kuwait, like, you're not going to have a high threat level there. You're not there near an active threat like you are in Iraq or Jordan stuff. Well, not even really Jordan. But uh, you're not expecting to have something. So it's just like one of those things like any day anything can happen, you know. So you constantly get these briefs about what FBCon level you're in, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta. Um, and so you're, just, you're kind of tailoring your day based off of the briefing of what you're receiving and prep, preparing yourself both mentally and physically for what could be happening and creating a mental checklist. Okay, what do I need to do in this aspect? Because back here, you're not worried about that. You're not thinking about what do I need to do to – in case this happens, you know, it happened there, it happens. And then you just reactively there in the desert, you're pro react, you're proactive, you're prepared already before what's going to happen. You're, you've already thought about what you're going to do. Um, so really outside of that, um, that's pretty much it, I guess, as far as the different experiences, what in a deployed versus stateside. So you, you never got to like, explore the countries at all while you were over there or see any of the actually um i did get to explore some of the countries while i was over there and it's crazy how different of a culture they have i mean you, you can't look at the women there um they're all covered because um, it's very offensive to be looking at the women there so if we were ever off um, site you couldn't see them or look at them or even try to glance that way because it just it could cause a confrontation which you just don't want to cause because then it just becomes a political matter. And some of those nations we're friends with, and so we don't want to damage diplomatic relations with these nations. And, uh, but a lot of their cities are beautiful. Um, like Kuwait City, um, gorgeous, so much money, it's insane. Like their malls are like, I don't, it's like streets of gold, like it's just, it's just like, <laughs> It, it's so massive, like like a mall here, like a traditional aisle that you'd walk down is about 40 to 50 feet. There, it's like a six-lane highway, wow. you know? And there's, and a lot of their malls are even outdoor, too, where they have these, and all the buildings, like, for the stores look like government buildings downtown, you know? Like, you walk by, and they have a lot of the similar stores that we do. So you walk by, and you see H&M, and it's like a castle. <laughs> and you're like, why? You know? And then... Like Dubai, like everything's made of gold, you know, and it's just, just like why? But they just have so much money, you know. Um, so it's it's unique in that regard. It's just how, it's crazy because you just don't think you think of Middle East and you think of like underdeveloped, you know. And I had that men's mindset when I went there. Now, with that being said, though, it is underdeveloped in the sense of a whole, but its cities are overdeveloped. So it's very like sparse because it is desert country, right? So you're going to have these few safe havens of like, not necessarily safe, but just developed havens within those countries that are really overdeveloped. And I guess that's also probably why they're so overdeveloped is because you really can't develop anywhere else in that country because it's desert, you know? <laughs> um, but uh, they had a lot of the similar things we do. They do a lot of similar, like they go to the movies, but at their movies they have edamame, which I had never had before, which is like a form of green beans instead of popcorn. And I love them now, but uh, they're really good. Um, so they, they have like different cultural changes like that, you know, um, like certain foods they won't eat or certain foods they will eat, you know, like they'll eat dog, you know, which you wouldn't traditionally do that over here. So that was kind of unique. Um, I got to try dog. Um, most people probably think that's disgusting, but whatever. Um, and then you, you see llamas and you see camels and you see all these other different types of animals you normally wouldn't see. You, and you see camel spiders. They're huge. Mm -hmm. Not that big. Probably not that big. It's the biggest one I saw. Camel spiders. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, so they're not really poisonous. So like they, if they were to bite you, it's not going to but they will leave damage. Um, but scary about them, though, is like the noise they make. It, they're strumming what they do. And it's just like, it's just a haunting noise when you hear it. And you're just like, oh. You know, but we did have um, other types of arachnids. We had to wear like brown recluses. Like they bite you. We actually had a guy who got bit in the butt, and now he has a hole in his butt for the rest oh of his life. 
he's he's safe, but he just he he waited two days, two or three days until reported it, and so now he has a hole <laughs> in his butt. <laughs> it's crazy, but uh, <laughs> um, other stuff that was unique besides the animals, the cities, um, their people are actually pretty nice, um, and they're nice to Americans as long as you don't give them a reason to be on hostility or on offensive against you and a lot of them share different traditional values that we would normally not see here in america like for instance uh if you're on a subway or on a train or anything of that nature in the middle east and there was a and you were sitting down and then you hit a stop and elderly person got on everyone's looking at you and you're like why are they looking at me and it's because the the youngest person's supposed to give up their seat for the oldest person so even though you've been sent down for like the past two or three train stops and this other person got on, it's not just like automatically understood that, oh, I get to keep this spot because I've been here. No, it's understood that you get up and you give your seat to the elderly person, which is something we don't really necessarily see here day to day, you know? It, whereas there, it's reinforced pretty heavily because you're getting me mugged if you don't. <laughs> um, um, outside of that, uh, yeah, they're really nice and um, and they're, they're a lot s- smarter than you would typically think. Um, just from what we, we hear about, because people talk about our education systems being the best in the world and our institutions and our colleges that we have here in the United States. But there are some s- smart people in the Middle East. It's insane. Um, and it's really cool because it's, it's not just like Middle Eastern people. It's a blend of other people, too. You have Russians that come down. You have Indian Indians that are also come in there from India. Um, so you have a, just this huge dynamic of all these different cultures and religions, you know, much like ours in a sense. So it's kind of cool. Um, it's more prevalent there, though, because those countries are nearby, whereas here it's more scarce because we're further away. And a lot of times people that you meet that are from, oh, they say I'm French. They're probably like, their parents are French, and they're like, they were born and raised in America, you know, so they're not really authentic French in a sense. Um, and then the language. Um, before you go to these countries, you would have to learn certain words and back brief yourself and prepare yourself on different cultures and values and learn and become familiar with our language to be able to speak it on a basic novice level to communicate. And also with that being said, you learn like certain colors are offensive in other cultures. So like in Korea, alarm red is, the color red is bad. So like the whole Air Force had to change their code from being alarm red to alarm blue within Korea. You know what I mean? It's offensive, you know? Um, so you can't wear certain color garments there and we're, and you can't wear certain color garments on certain days in there as well. So it's, it's just really interesting. You, you really, you almost become a different person just for that culture and kind of like mold yourself around them and learning it. It's kind of cool and unique in that regard. Um, so it's eye opening to that extent. You briefly mentioned before, uh, Operation Inherent Resolve. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and how it may have played a role in? So, currently, uh, Operation Inherent Resolve is just a it's a way of it's a it's a name labeled for the task of removing terrorist terroristic threats. And what really is, I hate when we say ISIS because it's just not just ISIS. There's other terrorist groups and organizations, and so it's an enduring pact that's lasting for not just ISIS, but any type of terrorist organization that poses a threat, not just on our country, but the world or any foreign relations or foreign nations of that regard. Um, And so a lot of that, my mission within that piece was prepping jets, getting them loaded and going out and bombing these ISIS strongholds at the time um, and removing that threat from the area. And so, the entire time I was there, we took ISIS down from being, I forget the amount of square mileage, but I still remember the percentage. Um, so within a two year time frame, we moved them down from being within 90% of the land they owned down to below 7%. And that 7% was down in Syria at that point in time. I don't know what it is currently, but at the time from when I left, that was kind of cool statistically. Like, wow, we did this, you know, within two months. I mean, within two years um, of being there. And it wasn't just me, it was everybody. And it's inherent resolve isn't just like, oh, this base does inherent resolve. It's an active campaign mission that encompasses not just the base I was at, but every base, all the bases within that area. 
um, even down towards Syria. Um, and you have all these different units that cycle in and out within this campaign mission, and you have certain units that are dedicated to these missions. You know, like I said, or I spoke earlier, like Red Tails, um, which is the Alabama Guard unit, you know. They have rotations like Shaw Air Force Base, Langley Air Force Base. They all come out there and they do a certain rotation of two or three months. And then another base comes in and does for two, three months. And they keep switching out their fighters and jets and stuff like that. And sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's less. It just depends on the mission. Um, but it, it's just a, a point of like enduring freedom is the best way I, expect, I can explain it. Um, and preserving that within the context of the Middle Eastern culture. How did it feel being a part of an operation like that? So, for me, I really didn't even know I was a part of it <laughs> <laughs> until uh, like three or four months into my first, I went to my first um, glo like base meeting, in a sense, for, um, for that mission and that campaign. And they were just giving a briefing about what we've done in the past four months. And so you just saw like the photographs of the places that before and after and after you bond them and then you see the pictures afterwards of the refugees that are getting um, saved and moved out of those places and translates so that's nice but then it's also kind of presents this heartache to you because there's collateral damage there's civilians you kill and you hurt and the, it's not just that it's children too and it, it's it's happens war and so you become adjusted to that and um which sounds bad, uh, but it's more so, the best way I can explain it is not necessarily numb to it, but just aware that it is the way it is. And you just kind of push it back to the back burner and you go forth from day to day. And so for me, what would help traditionally in that sense would be not looking at the bigger picture, right? Because I'm a bigger picture thinker. I like to look at how see how everything works together and combines and makes everything work in unison, you know? Just like cog works in a clock. So for me, it was just about, okay, I just need to look at step A. What am I doing here? So I would just look at my day-to-day -day task and like, are right, I'm doing this or what can I do next? So I wouldn't even give myself time to stop and think, really. Um, and I just kept myself really saturated with tasks, you know? And even if I wasn't on the job performing a duty, I was off the job working out at the gym or going to eat something or hanging out with a guy doing spades. And spades is actually a pretty mentally stimulating task. It's, you, there's a lot of thought thinking and then poker as well. So I just kept myself really mentally stimulated. And if I wasn't in a place where I could do that, I was constantly reading, constantly absorbing material and digesting reading material for my mind um, to keep it off the, the emotional thoughts that would come to mind, you know? Um, and then also it was scary the first time I was laying, I was sleeping and I woke up and it's like, I'm around jets. I've been around jets for a while at this point before I go overseas, of course. So I know what sounds like, what jets should sound like. And when they sound like when they're doing combatives and when they sound like, it's like within a stateside aspect, when you hear jets, there's, there's, there's something called noise abatement where jets can't fly below that altitude because it's for civilian personnel and to not cause so much noise in the area of that city. Even just bases like Shaw Air Force Base up in Sumter, um, near here outside of Columbia, um, they can't fly below a certain level because it just causes noises to the people living in the area, you know? Or So that's, to kind of combat that, their noise abatement doesn't exist. So like they'll fly, like I remember I walked out of my tent one morning and I had my toiletries and stuff, getting ready to walk into the cat Cadillac shower and this jet does a low pass and below me. And I, I, he must have been 20 feet above me. And, that's, and I didn't have my ear in protection. And I, I thought I was getting bombed. I thought I was, I was like, I'm dead, you know? <laughs> but it was just them just doing a show of force is what we call it. And they're just like, and then everyone else came out of their tents and like started yelling and cheering and stuff like that. Just, but for me, it was my first time. So it was like a culture shock. So I was also had to get used to like those guys doing combatives and show of forces within the area of our own jurisdiction or our living area, you know, like they can fly as low as they want. Um, not, that's not necessarily true always, but they would do that sometimes. Um, but also being part of that mission also kind of, it may, it put a name to the impact I was doing. Cause you can always see impact, you know, 
Um, like if you go out and you go and give food to the homeless, you know, you see that, which that's very good. That's all. That's awesome. But then when you put a name to something like that, it kind of makes you feel like, oh, I'm so special and honorable. So like you think like not not trying to be like arrogant or anything, but it's kind of cool because you think like, wow, this is official official. You know, this is a world official event. It's something you can Google and you look up and you see it, you know. So it's kind of cool to think of it in that regard. Um, but it's also, like I said, it's a humbling experience because you have to relearn your way of life, the way of thinking, as I've said previously. So... What was the highest rank you earned? So I was actually, the highest rank I achieved was E4, but I had a promotion line number for E5. And then by the time I got out, I uh, which E5 is a staff sergeant. By the time I was getting out, I was afforded the opportunity to, to promote, but I decided to not take it because um, I wasn't happy with my job and I wanted to do something I loved. And my body was being destroyed at that point, um, just because the human body is not meant to be on their knees that much, lifting that much weight, going all these different types of dexterity angles and stuff like that to load munitions or work on jets or fix jets or, you know, even just sitting in the cockpit, your, your body is just not meant to be in that mm-hmm. state. Even people who are a certain boat height can't even sit in a cockpit because it's just uh, so unnatural um, for the human body. And uh, so it's just, it's it was weird. And... I got sciatica. I had um, I had a missile hit me in the the, the head. I got eighteen um, staples in my head because of that thing. Um, it wasn't the missile itself, so it wasn't like an explosion. It was the canard of the missile, which is a part of the guidance system, which is on the front portion of the missile as well as the tail end of the missile, and it just allows it more aerodynamic and steers it through flight. And so that's what hit me. Um, and so like there's stuff like that, and you're just like man, I'm 25 years old and there's sometimes I wake up out of bed and I feel like an old man. This is not good. <laughs> man, I got to do 14 more years. Oh boy. Oh boy. So it's just scary come to that. And then, like I said, I wanted to be happy. And my heart was in computers and cybersecurity. And part of the things that motivated me to also do it is during this time frame within the military, I got a, I had a briefing that was called in and and I also received a letter in the mail stating that my identity was taken, you know? And it wasn't, like, used for, like, ulterior motives as far as, like, financial stuff, but in the sense that they had my address, they had my phone number, they had my social, they knew my family, stuff like that. And it was ISIS that had it. And so that's scary, and you're just like, wow. And it's because we had a lack of cybersecurity within the military. Mm-hmm. And so that also kind of funneled my frustrations as well as desire and motivation to do something within cybersecurity because I enjoy it. And from being on airframes and troubleshooting and stuff, I kind of like figuring out what's wrong and how to fix it, you know? Mm-hmm. And so cybersecurity definitely entails that. And actually, that's why I came back here to USC Aiken, one of the reasons. Um, so I got in the military, like I said, I came back here and I failed out of the same institution previously. And I was in Vegas, all the way on the West Coast. So I could have went to any other college I wanted to but I came back here because I wanted to conquer where I failed at before and prove to myself that I can be different. I can be a different man. I am a different man than the man I was of six years ago, or actually mm-hmm. 10 years ago at the time, because that's when I last went to school here, rough nine years, roughly. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was just crazy to think about, I can do this, I can do this. And after my first semester here, I, I did really well, uh, make good grades. I'm like, okay, this is something that can be possible plausible because you know you get out of the military and you're just like i get another source of income i gotta like start getting stuff done taken care of i'm like can i even do this because i've been out of school for 10 years i'm like i'm gonna be terrible at math i'm gonna be terrible at english terrible at all these subjects there's no way i'm out of date i'm thinking i'm out of date because i'm a decade behind and so that was just really scary for me um transitioning back thinking that i could do it and then once i came back I actually performed really well and assimilated pretty decently so That was scary, in a sense, but, yeah. Um, Going back to your rank, um, how long does it take to achieve that rank? So, um, I don't know how it is in other branches, but in the Air Force. um, So, if you sign a six-year contract, um, you actually promote faster. 
versus signing a four-year contract within the Air Force. So what that means is for me, right when I signed my six-year contract, that right when I graduated my tech training, I automatically sewed on E3, right? Mm -hmm. Now it's 28 months within that grade, time and grade, um, then you can get senior airmen. Mm -hmm. And then after, um, no, no, actually, false. 13 months after being in that rank, you um, achieve the rank of senior airmen, which is E4. And then after 28 months, two years and like four months, um, then you can test your staff. So overall timeline you're looking at if you did an E6, you can make staff as early as your fifth year mark, five year staff, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then you have other little programs hidden within these promotional structures, like for instance, step promotion, where if you do something really good or you've been really good at your job or it's rare, or just something that was worth commendation, they could step promote you instantly. You don't have to take a test, you don't have to do anything, you just get put the rank on you. Um, and then you have other stuff called BTZ, which is below the zone, which means you're above your peers, and so you get promoted faster, uh, which means for sen it's only for senior airmen, which is E4. You can actually promote faster by six months um, than you normally would, and so on the rank. So, which is very meaningful because it's an extra $50, I don't know what it is now, but back then it was like an extra $50 a paycheck, which is $100 a month, which is $600 over six months. And then your BH rate goes up too, so it's just like, it's, it's a meaningful impact. Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as uh, E5, um, you, like I said, you take a test. Once you make the test and you get the rank, you get something called a line number. And this line number dictates when you will sew on that rank. So if you're like, if you're like line number 6,000, 7,000, then you might be sewn on eight months to a year from now. But all these line numbers fit within the time window of a year. So usually if you make, if you're told you're made rank, you're going to be sewn on within a year, you automatically know. Now, with that being said, these line numbers are subject to change at any month, month, time frame. Because something might happen crazy in the Air Force where a bunch of, like I'll say, 20% of um, avionics guys got out, and so they need to fill that void. So they're going to go ahead and promote the staffs for that career field first and bring them up. Even though they didn't score as high as you did on the test, they're going to bring them up forward because they need them. It's on a need basis. And so, and it's also important to, Think about your grade also, like the, your test scores. Um, it takes more into account your time and service as well. So like let's say I'm going up against an eight-year senior airman, which he's about to hit his higher tenure, which higher tenure means if they don't make rank that year, they have to get out of the military. And so if I'm going up against him and it's my first year testing for staff and I score the highest you could possibly score or one of the highest scores you can make on that test, he is still going to sew on before me, even though I scored way higher than him, possibly, um, because he's has more time in the service than I do, because he's been in for eight years versus me being in for four, you know? So, um, but yeah, so on the, the soonest you can sew on rank is typically, for E5, rank would be um, at your fifth year, and then average is usually um, six to seven for staff. Have you ever experienced psychological issues caused by your military service? Um, as spoken briefly, um, having loss, um, that's hard. Uh, being away from family the first time during a holiday was hard. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of have to like train your mind to be positive. And like I said, for me, during those times I was experiencing those issues, I, at times I would get a counselor or I had a buddy I could talk to where I would just saturate myself with things to do to keep my mind off of those issues I was thinking. Um, it did translate into some instances where, like an event would happen and it would, it would scare me or make me jump more so than like it would to a normal person who doesn't have to experience this. Nothing to the point where I would dive on the ground and put my hands over my head like you see in the movies for that extent. But enough to shock me and scare me and be like, relax, chill, you know? Yeah. Um, it's more so prevalent within my dreams and with certain physical things I have. Like, I have something called restless leg syndrome. Um, and then at night I'll wake up with my legs shaking and I can't get it to stop. It's the weirdest thing in the world. So super, super weird. Um, and... I mean, that's as far as psychological issues, that's pretty much it. Um, and then also getting over the mindset of like, 
putting your professional before personal. Um, so even though certain when you when you you're asked to do certain jobs that might question your your morals, your ethics, and stuff, but you're required to do it, you know. And so you have to put that in the backstage, you know, and go out there and do your performance, and then go back and handle what you just did and think about it and be like, I'm going to live with this. I, I accept this. You know, this is what I signed up for. You know, I'm doing and, and I'm doing this for a greater purpose and I'm doing this for people back in the States. And so really just flooding your, your mindset and those your th- with thoughts of stuff like that really helped me um, during those times. And then also going to the gym, I can't explain. <laughs> going to the gym, like even for me now, like I, I stopped going to the gym for like six months and I just started going back. My grades have gone up. It's, I don't know how to explain it. It's just, it's just like this stress relief window that allows you to, because you're releasing endorphins, in it, but it just helps. Do you have any other ways you're coping with it now? Um, for me, uh, honestly, going to school has been coping with it. Being around other traditional students, freshmen, um, seeing their day-to-day lives, what issues they have, um, being in a classroom environment keeps me busy enough. Um, studying for tests, uh, that type of thing has really elevated me. And then also, when I got here, I joined the veterans office here on campus, and I work there now. And being a part of that program has allowed me to be a part of a veteran community that has been there as a support network for me in ways I couldn't have imagined. And so, anytime I've had issues, I've had someone in there I can go to and talk to. And then there's also this idea of personal improvement I've kind of invoked within my life. And it's kind of, I wouldn't say I invoked um, probably 50-50. My boss, Robert Murphy, in the Veteran Center, he's actually a Marine retirement retiree, um, has really set goals for me. And putting goals short-term, long-term, mid-term, and achieving that goal and seeing it produced and what it harvest it yields for me has been nice and then like keep building on it, keep building on it, like a step A, step B, step C and keep going through and grinding it out. And so having that network there has been phenomenal for me. And just this last week I went to a scholarship reception where I um, attained a scholarship on the behalf of what that community over there is doing. And I was able to meet actually with my donor who donated that money for me and it was a personal relationship and I got to hear her hardships and everything that she went through and how she relates to the military and so it's kind of unique because a lot of times when you go through hurt and you go through pain you go through psychological issues you always think I'm alone Mm -hmm. but it's nice to be under the lens that I'm not alone and there's other people who share the same problems I do and some of theirs cast shadows on mine you know, and make mine not look like that big of a deal. And so when you see someone who's going through even more than you are and they're persevering through it, it's empowering to you. Mm-hmm. And I can't tell you how many times that's happened to me since being over there in that office where you see someone, man, they're going through something even worse than I am. How can I complain? Get, get through it, man. Mm-hmm. And so that's been empowering for me and helped me out a lot. And you said you left the military in January? Mm-hmm. January 22nd. Uh, what contributed to your decision to leave instead of re-enlisting? So, like I said, I I wasn't happy with life. Um, I was doing things that were against my ethics in a sense um, by being in the military for that guard, for that regard. Um, and I wasn't afforded a cross-training opportunity. I wanted to do something called cyber transport within the military, which is network security, um, cyber security. Um, but because of my job, we were worth our weight in gold. For many percentage, when I got out, was 37%. That's very low manned. So I wasn't able to cross-train at my traditional cross-training window of five years to six years. Mm-hmm. And um, well, 59 months up to 61 months. But uh, so I wasn't afforded that opportunity. And at the time, I also wanted to, I wanted to get my education. I felt like the further I was not away from education it'd be harder for me to go back Mm -hmm. to do college now with that being said you can do college within the military but i just didn't have time to do so with my current job and what i was doing my outlook and like i said it wasn't just hurting me mentally but it was hurting my body physically 
and uh, I knew what would be the repercussions if I were to do 20 years, you know. Um, with that being said, if I was for the opportunity to do a job I wanted, I would have easily done 20. I love the atmosphere. I love the people. I loved everything I did around it, and it grew me a lot as a person. I'm in the mindset of a 35-year-old man as opposed to a 26-year-old man. Um, it grew me up in ways that going to college traditionally, like most people would have, it would I, I wouldn't be even the same person or maturity level or discipline. So I'm thankful for that. Um, and I, I really appreciate what the Air Force has done for me. It's it's really saved my life in a lot of ways from spiraling downwards into a pit. Um, and I've even thought about after I graduate and going back as an officer, I've even I've even had thoughts of that. So there's even that thought of, oh, I get out temporarily and I come back as an officer um, and continue my service. But it was more so I wanted to do something that I love and enjoy. And then it was hard being away from family. My, my parents and my family only saw me probably three or four times in my six-year enlistment. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. And so being away from a family is hard. And I needed to be a part of them because my sisters were getting married. I was missing weddings. I was missing my niece and nephews being born, birthdays, stuff like that. And those are important parts of your life. And I'm really close with those family members. So being at those events is normal for our family. Mm -hmm. And so it hurt not being able to be there in those circumstances. So I guess that's also another reason why I moved back to Aiken mm -hmm. and got out of the military. <laughs> yeah. So you started back here at USC Aiken in the spring semester, correct? Mm -hmm. So you came right out of the military and not just back into civilian life, but into college life. How many days was it between so leaving? <laughs> there was no, I really, it was a seamless transition. I actually, I was still technically in the military when I started college here because classes started here on January 14th and my termination date from the military was January 22nd. Now, with that being said, I did gamble because let's say the military was to call me back during that 60 day terminal leave and say, hey, we need you for manning. Cause like I said, my manning level was super low. But luckily, I had enough rapport with my chain of command and people around me that liked me. They weren't gonna. They said, even if we need you, we're not gonna call you back. You go ahead and start your future. And that was also part of the reasons what motivated me to also get out. I guess to answer Bruce quick, my boss, my fight chief. One of the last days in his office, he. Um, so traditionally, when you get out of the military, it's just separating. You don't get like an award. You don't get a plaque or anything. Um, but I walked in his office and he gave me this plaque and it had a tomahawk axe on it, right? And had all the names of all my unit servicemen that served alongside me, had our mission statement, had the reaper on the back, because that's what we are. It's our bringers of death is what we call it. And it said, giving, um, giving our enemies a chance to die for their country. <laughs> but, uh, anyways, uh, but he told me that and then he's like, I know you're leaving. I'm sad you're leaving, but I said I know you're meant to leave. And I was like, "What do you mean?" He's like, "You're you're too smart to be here. You're meant for bigger and better things in your life." And I, he said, "I expect a phone call when you hit those bigger and better things. <laughs> you have my number." That's and that was it. And I shook his hand and walked out and never saw him again. But uh, to this day, um, so that was kind of empowering. But uh, yes, yeah, seamless transition. Um, January 14th, I started classes here, and I got out on the 22nd. So I really didn't stop my time in search as far as going back into the school. So, And as far as my timeline for finishing my um, academics, I plan on doing it within two years. And actually, unfortunately, I'm going to be transferring to Augusta University in the spring because the computer science program there is a bit more developed and fits my needs more for what I need. And the program's NSA and CIA certified. So... Um, it's better marketable in that aspect. And then for me, who's trying to complete my degree in two to two and a half years and then go straight to my master's program, I can't do that here. Um, there's not a master's program even offered here. And then second, the computer science program, I, here I can't take computer science classes within the summer. And so I'm, I'm full time. So even I'm not taking a break. I'm going to classes during the summer and fall and spring. So And they don't offer them here in the summer. So I would really set myself back a good year and a half if I were to decide to continue to finish out my computer science degree here. Yeah. Returning um, to civilian life, was there a culture shock or an adjustment period? Luckily, um, 
I had my family around me during that first short period of time being back. Um, and then I, I really stumbled into that office um, here. And I think that's what that was the biggest difference. I think that was the wild card. Um, because I had to go through there because I'm using benefits to pay for my college. And going in that uh, office, I was around that environment of people there. And it was kind of like my step to the front door. And once that front door was open, it was all the way open. And I was in there and the door was closed behind me and I wasn't getting back out, you know? <laughs> um, which, sounds like kidnapping, but it was a good kind of kidnapping. <laughs> um, maybe man napping, I guess. I'm 26. But... <laughs> uh, uh, so it was a culture shock at first. It's, it was hard for me to adjust to not having free time. Um, I wasn't used to, all right, I can go do this right now. Let's go do this. Like, it was just weird. Um, I'm used to always like having my day planned out and having A, B, C, D. And so it was weird having me time on a, another level. I've had me time when I was in the military, but on a little level, but it's on a exponential level now. Um, so that was weird. Uh, and then also seeing the way people talk to people, um, like yes or no, ma'am, it's not really super, um, as prevalent here as it is in the military. So I had to adjust to that, uh, for certain people, cause some people take that as offensive. Um, and then just having this sense of freedom that I didn't have before. Um, I'm not used to being able to do and make decisions at my own free will that sense um you still can in the military to a large extent but a lot of that's curbsided and pushed away where you can't um hmm. uh culture shock yeah i also had to find out i need to get my health insurance i need to start getting my housing squared away i need to start planning and getting my everything taken care of and financially stable um, so that was a huge transition. Luckily, I planned that for prior, but it was still like a shock. Okay, this is it. You know, there is no fallback plan, whereas in the military, like, it's the government paying you. You're guaranteed that paycheck unless the government shuts down. But uh, in the government, you're you're guaranteed. So now it's more so I got to start thinking long-term and planning my long-term for myself, whereas the military, I don't really have to think of so much about because I know at 20 years I'm getting a retirement check, you know? So I had to think in that type of long-term thinking. Um, and then also not wearing a uniform was weird. I, I remember the first week or two, I, I always went to go grab my uniform out of my closet before I, my regular clothes, going to class. And I'm like, and actually the first day I actually put on my pants, not my full uniform, but my pants. I'm like, what are you doing, dummy? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah. You've told us a little bit about you thinking about maybe going back as an officer or getting your master's, but where do you kind of see yourself in five years? So I see myself in five years with a master's and just finished my, my master's or in the process of doing so and attaining a job while in my master's doing something with the government um, or a private sector company, um, even doing maybe working with a large bank handling their cybersecurity affairs networking troubleshooting faults or threats cyber threats that they have and then maybe stepping foot into at the end of my master's program into a job that deals with washington dc and the pentagon um, i think that would be something that'd be really cool to do um, in handling cyber threats on a national level of interest and combating it for our country because uh, it is the craziest thing that's going to happen if we don't get ahead of it. I read in the Wall Street Journal actually about three weeks ago that if we don't have, if we don't upkick our cyber um, degree holders within uh, graduates from colleges within 10 years, other countries, foreign countries are going to have codes that can break our banks, our national banks, and steal money from them. Yeah. And, and into the Federal Reserve. And that's crazy. Within 10 years, that's happening yeah. if we don't get our stuff together. And so, and they're getting smarter. They're getting better at it, too. So I, I really want to be a part of that, you know, process and combat it. And I know it's the right fit for me because we had a Mandiant come in, which is a company that actually handled the cyber intrusion that happened during the 2016 poll elections and DNC and all that. And hearing him talk about it and how he solved it, 
I got excited, you know, my heart started racing and like afterwards I went up there and talked to him and I was just like, this is for me. And so that was like the, I just knew, you know, this is where I need to be. Um, overall, was your military service positive or negative? I would say 100% positive. Um, even though there was negatives, it definitely outweighs through its positive nature. Um, I, I remember when I, I first talked to my mom uh, when I was starting to get out, and I told her, I was like, I just feel like, like I said, I was scared to come back to college. And she said, I told her, I was like, I'm so behind everybody. I'm, I'm 26 years old. I'm, I'm almost 30, you know? <laughs> and I'm in my bachelor's program, and I just feel like I'm so behind, you know? These these kids. I, not kids, but uh, these adult, other adults um, are 18, 19 years old, and they're in bachelor's, they're in the same you know, place I am in my life. And she said, no, they're not. And I was like, what do you mean? She said, well, they don't have near the life experience or discipline that you have. And when you step out of your degree, you already have that resume built up from a military background, whereas they don't. They're going to have to get that after they graduate, getting job experience before they step into a bigger job. Whereas for you, it'll be a lot easier for you to transition. So that was kind of reassuring, but I'm still like, oh, I don't really think you need it. But um, so that was kind of scary. But did your military service change you? Like, how did it change you? Hundred percent changed me. Um, I was a dirty kid, um, messy. Um, I was stupid smart, but I and I, I wasn't disciplined. Um, even when my mom would tell me to mow the lawn and stuff like that, I still mow the lawn. But I might be like a day late. I was a good kid. I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. Still don't. Um, but there's just things that were lacking for me as a man. And it was largely because that I didn't have a dad in those crucial years of growing up. I'm not going to say I'm blaming all on that, you know. Um, definitely some of it was self-derived. Um, but my mom was, her, her hands were full. You know, she had six other kids actively at one time, you know, to raise. And so, and I was the only boy out of her children, you know, and she had five girls and one boy and the other boys were from my dad's side, you know, and I, they're down in Florida. I never saw them since after I was three. So I really had to like grow myself up in a lot of ways and teach myself. And so the military really kind of like went back and redid the framework and be like, okay, no, this is not what you need to be. This is no, no, get rid of this, get rid of this, put this in there, you know, and build my my plateau in my house of what it means to be a man and building that house of just what it means to be a man is enough to overdo all these mistakes and negatives I say I got from the Air Force because um, I'm more driven now than I've ever been because of it whereas before I would have I was a procrastinator like now I'm so clean I have lawnmower vacuum marks in my carpet <laughs> 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 so it's just it's just weird stuff like that it just changes you and, and, and I mean that also comes with age it's maybe not just the military because you start learning that you're taking care of your own things that you pay for it it's yours you only have it once you know so you're a lot more responsible in a sense what would you most like civilians to know about mil the military service it's not as combat oriented as you may think um a lot of the jobs that are in the military, actually most of the jobs, aren't directly combat related. Um, they're indirectly combat related, like your finance personnel or the people who maintain the gym. Those guys handle the finances for combat people or personnel, or they, they keep the gym up, gym up and running for them to go to and do stuff. The guys who check the card at the gate, you know, before you get on base, they're all a part of that support network. So it's not really as combat driven as most people think. Um, like someone who goes in and works a nine to five job and they clock out, a lot of jobs are like that. And the only difference is the uniform really and some of the additional dues you have to do and the contract, of course. Um, if you're one of those people in your life and you're, you've, you've hit a low, and I mean, it doesn't have to be like an extreme low like mine was, but you just find yourself lost, the military will help you find you and find who you are, find your place within the world. And where you need to find yourself 10 years from now, just that, who you are now. And it gives you those tools to put in your tool belt. So that, because I find myself constantly day to day where I'm like, oh, wow, I have this tool I can use for this situation because the military prepped me for it. Whereas before I didn't have that. And you're, you're looking, let's say you're just looking to get education and you need it and it's expensive for you. 
join, do a four-year enlistment, or you're trying to join because you want to, you know, you feel like you're lacking, you want a brotherhood or you want a fatherhood type of father role models, join the military. If you're looking to serve your country and you love your country, join. Um, don't be afraid, don't be scared, because there's a job for anybody. Um, now, with that being said, there's physical requirements, but there's a job for anybody out there, as long as you're willing to be patient and work for it. Um, and then also do your research. Um, know what you're getting into. Know what job you're going to do. Because just because of what it says on paper doesn't mean what, it's actually gonna be, what you're actually going to be doing. Because there's many times where I was like, oh, I'm pretty sure I'm not supposed to be doing this, <laughs> but I guess I'm doing this now. Um, and then... Just in, treat it not as like a fear, but as an, a new, like you're going on vacation. I know that sounds so weird, but you technically are because you're traveling. You're going across the world. You're experiencing all these new different things. You're, you're building yourself up during this time. And it almost was my reprieve from life from when I was 18 years old up until now where I was, I was kind of removed from the world. Like people tell me what movies... You know, do you, have you heard this movie? Have you heard of this movie or this TV show? I'm like, no. I'm like, this. are you crazy? I was like, yeah. Was, during that time frame, I was in the military. It was kind of like a black hole. I really didn't know what was going on as far as, like, um, movies and stuff go and stuff like that, music to that extent. Um, but uh, just don't be afraid to join. Um, it's not as bad as some people paint it out to be. And you're going to get more out of it than what you think. Um, and it's worth it. So if you're, if, I really just really, if anyone like with a heavy heart, you're going through stuff, the military can save you and it saved my life. And it still is to this day, helping me with a lot of things. So. Is there anything else that we haven't covered that you'd like to, to add? Whew. Well, we talked you a lot talked already. talked a lot, yeah. I, I need some water. Um, <laughs> uh. You were very thorough. Yeah. <laughs> I believe that's it. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Jared. You're and welcome. thank you for your service. All right. I'm going. Thank you. And thank you for paying your taxes. <laughs>